I've been to this church, uh, I'm ashamed to say I've been in Exeter about six years now. I've been here twice before. Once was um, for Choices Pregnancy. I, I wasn't pregnant <laughs> for, for the launch of Choices Pregnancy, which is great. Uh, and the other was for the, um, I don't know what you call it in the Pentecostal church. We have all sorts of bizarre terms like you know, enthronement or installation or whatever. But, but for the um, plumbing in of Mark Pugh. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was great. And, and what a gift he is. He's been nice about me. I've got to be nice back now. Um, I, I discovered something about Mark this week. Uh, I discovered he has a, uh, he's far more cultured than he gives off the impression, really. Uh, he said he loves going to art galleries. Who knew? And, and just in a worship earlier, I was just struck by, by thinking about Mark and Nita and the family, uh, of them being a precious gift to you as a church. And, and, and just the sense of like a, a precious painting. I know nothing about art. Ask Mark about art. A precious painting, you put it on the wall so you can benefit from what it has to offer. But I was just struck that there's a cost there. By putting a, a painting on a wall, there's the cost of the kind of light exposure and, and, and what happens to that painting over the years. And I just, to just encourage you, you do it anyway, I'm sure, but just, just to be praying for them as a couple and their family. As, as a family leading church, not putting them on the wall to reverence them and to think they're amazing and perfect. You know, I don't know them well, but I know they're far from perfect. Um, <laughs> but, but to honour them in prayer and support for the exposure of leadership and ministry and protect them. I also, uh, at the, um, uh, Mark's um, plumbing in, uh, it was John Glass who spoke, wasn't it? And, and I, I hear lots of talks and don't often remember many words. The only thing I remember of what Mark said earlier in the week and talk he was giving was that he likes art. Um, but I remember one thing John said, and I just thought it was so prophetic for you as a church. He talked about Naaman being healed of his leprosy. And he talked about Naaman having to come to the river. And I don't know how clever he was being, how much he was playing on the words there, but actually he talked about the fact that Naaman, this general, this person with amazing kind of badge of office and, and the robes or the military garments, the only way he could get healed was to take off his status, take off the stuff that made him look good and come to the river and be washed. And, and I just felt that that's something God's given you as a church, that, that no, no pretense, no upfront, no great robes or looking good, but people coming to the river and being washed. And as I was praying about that, I felt there's another bit to it. Naaman wasn't from that land. And, and you have a real ministry just looking out at you guys. You're in Exeter. It's one of the whitest cities in the area, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and you have a mix of ethnicity and, and, and places people come from. And you know, at the moment, who knows who's watching on the internet and where they are? Yeah, they could be in Plymouth or anywhere. Um, and, and just that God has called you to be a place where people from the nations, whether literally physically in the building or on the internet or whatever, can have their lives changed by Jesus. And just I thought that was a really profound prophetic word from John. Um, I wanna, I, there's, in the Anglican world, we have set uh, readings for Sundays. Um, I'm afraid in our church we don't use them often, but um, you can't have Pentecost without reading the story of Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When a day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them. As Mark's already read, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Every bit of God's word is inspired, but not every bit needs to be read at this moment. They came from various places with long names. <laughs> we hear them declaring the words of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Peter preaches the first sermon, ostensibly according to the word of God. It was a lot shorter than this one. And the net result was 3,000 people came to faith. Yes. I've got faith. Longer sermon, less people. Um, 
Isn't it incredible? I, I think there are two moments in the Bible where I just don't, most of the Bible, I wish I'd been there. All the good bits. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but there are two bits kind of in, in church terms, so I just wish, wouldn't it have been great to be there? One is this. I don't know what was going on in the upper room at that moment, but I can make some guesses. They've been trapped in a room together, scared for their lives, the doors locked, grieving for Jesus, knowing Jesus has said, really, all he said is, is don't do anything. <laughs> Churches are not good and not doing anything. Yeah, we will have meetings about not doing anything rather than not do anything. <laughs> They're in this room and the arguments are breaking out. You know, the, the f- pressure, the tension, the stress in the room. And then all of a sudden, it stops. And we can't begin to imagine, you know, the, 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 as the Holy Spirit starts to move, you can imagine Thomas going, I don't think this is it. I have a few doubts. And, and Peter talking through the middle of it. And that, but something happened. That, that amazing outpouring, that the power of the Holy Spirit, powerfully present. The other one I love, and I, I just in my prayer, before I die, I want to lead a service like the consecration or dedication of the temple, where they dedicate the temple and they've spent months planning it. You know, we've got the new Bishop of Exeter being um, put in, whatever they do with him, um, on the 4th of July, and, and they're planning it at the moment. You know, it, it's the full might of the Church of England. How many men in dresses can you get in one building at one time? <laughs> and, and they've got all the details, and it will be choreographed to the finest moment. And, and um, all I care about is that I'm giving away free ice creams afterwards. <laughs> But, but you can just imagine, they've planned this dedication of temples so much, they know what they're doing, they've all got the gear on, they're all ready for it, and they start the service, and they're like, it's going well so far, good first song. And then all of a sudden, the power of God comes in such power, they can't carry on with the rest of the service. <laughs> that the presence of God is so strong, they can't do what they were going to do. And there's something that, that, that Gordon Fear, a famous theologian, does the world's biggest, fattest book on the Holy Spirit, and he calls it God's empowering presence. That's what the Spirit's about empowering presence the presence and power of God and what happens is they're filled and there's such a commotion that the people outside are struck something's going on something's happening in this building they're bewildered by it Now, I wonder, if you went out into Exeter and asked people how many of them are bewildered by Christians, probably quite a few are. But I don't know we're bewildered for the right reasons or they're bewildered for the right reasons. That they're bewildered because something's happening and people don't understand it, people don't get it. You know, some say they're drunk, but there's something. And, And the incredible thing is it's the most phenomenal experience, but it's not about the experience. And there's a real danger, isn't there? You know, I, 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 as, as Mark said, he slightly inflated it, saying I was in response for pastoral ministry. I'm, I'm like the pastoral gopher at Soul Survivor Festivals. If there's a job nobody else wants to do, normally involving diarrhea and vomiting or some, some issue, I get allowed to come and get involved. Um, uh, but I love, you know, Soul Survivor, one of the most exciting things is seeing 10,000 young people in a tent worshipping Jesus. Seeing the power of God poured upon them, that young people are, are you know, we don't like it, but, but crying out, the pain that's trapped inside them. Unspoken hurt of years, although they're only young, coming out as God begins to do stuff. But I only really care about the experience if it's like that, if it's something that's making a difference in their lives. And it's easy for us to come in here, for some of us, it's easy just to come in here and clap and get excited. For others, some of us, it's a little bit harder. But it's easy to get excited about the Spirit. But what were they waiting for? They weren't waiting for an experience. They weren't waiting for something that excited them. They weren't waiting for something that was like, yes, church has started. Jesus said this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's power with a purpose. It's not power to excite us. It's not power to make us feel better about ourselves. It's power with a purpose. And, and it's great because I don't know you guys. I don't know your church. I don't know the things you struggle with. But I guess you're pretty much like every other one. I was struck preparing this. That I wonder whether there's a danger for us. We believe in the Spirit. We're well up for the Spirit. We're up for Pentecostal power. But is there a danger that we've made the comforter, the counsellor, the other like Jesus into a comforter 
like a comfort blanket. We've made him, I think it's the American term, isn't it? A comforter. It's like the blanket that, that a kid holds themselves when they're a bit uncomfortable. That helps them sleep at night and we're not meant to be sleeping. Yeah, that we've been challenged. Like we're meant to be awake as the church, not feeling better. And, and, and the Spirit comes, actually not to make us comfortable. Not to make us feel better, but to make us better. And, and we as a church, Unlimited, we were set up by the bishop several years ago to try and reach a youth that have no idea about God. Yeah, there are great youth works in Exeter. You've got one of them. Uh, and, and they do loads of stuff with youth and mates come to it. And we wanted to go to the youth sat on the cathedral green that doesn't know a mate who's a Christian. And, and we go out and talk to guys. And, and one of the things we do, and in, in, in we felt God was calling us to do in doing that, is, is um, not to go up and tell people about Jesus, not to go and argue about Jesus, not to try and convince them, but to help them encounter God. Oh, yeah. and, and the model we use, and it's just, it's, you know, just what we feel we're meant to be doing at the moment, is, is just going up to guys on the green and, and saying, you know, ultimately, sort of chatting to them about stuff, but, but ultimately trying to say to them, do you know, could we pray for you? And can we pray for you quite specifically? Can we ask God? what he has to say about who you are, not what you got up to last night, you know, not the bad stuff in life, but who did he make you to be? Yeah. Who, who are you? Yeah. And, and can you know that? And, and if God knows you that well, then maybe, maybe you just want to find out a little bit more about him. We're struggling slightly with phase two. Uh, youth in Exeter are phenomenally plight. You know, we've prayed for about 600 guys in Exeter. We've had less than five be rude to us. If you went up to our age on the cathedral green, they'd be like, what do you want? What are you selling? I'm busy, go away. Um, these, they're, just, they're, they're just really you know, the opposite of what you expect from young people in crowds. Um, but, but we pray for them. And because of that, our team have kind of grown in confidence that they can pray and they can ask God to speak. And he'll speak and we listen. We don't always get it right, but we have a confidence God will speak. My danger is I feel we've reduced the Holy Spirit in our church down to we, we talk to God and God says stuff and we pray for people and we can say nice stuff over them. We can comfort them, whether in the church or out of the church. We can pray and we can say, well, Jesus loves you. And we all want that, don't we? we? We want God to say, I love you. We can come forward in ministry and we can be there, Lord. Lord, I just need a touch because then I'll feel better. Or I just need to know you love me. But actually, we know God loves us, or we should. We don't need God to keep coming and telling us he loves us. I've got two sons who are 12, 12 in a couple of weeks and 10. And, um, and wouldn't it be really odd if every morning Josh came running into our room and went, Daddy, 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 do you love me? Yeah, are you sure you love me? Do you love me as much as Toby? We do actually have that conversation quite a lot. But <laughs> who's your favourite? But it's me, isn't it? No, it's me. Um, but yeah, do, we, do we come to God? Do we come to church going, well, you know, I'm not really sure whether you love me. I'm not really sure if you like me. I'm not really sure if you'd use me. I know you'll use them. And is there a danger we expect the Spirit to just come and re reassure us? Now, I don't want to put down the fact the core work of the Spirit, Romans 8, is he, he inside us, testifies Abba, Father, witnesses. And, and, and many of us struggle with the belief that God loves us. But almost let's get that nailed. Let's sort that out. Let's know that truth. Let's not pray for that truth because it's already true. And then let's move on. Because of the work of the Spirit is he comes, he fills them with power and he's scared, terrified men who are there, who are meant to be leading the church, are so scared they're locked up in a room. The Spirit comes and what happens is something happens that they're out in the road and they're going, you lot, not just you need to believe in Jesus, but you lot killed Jesus. They're quite in your face. It's not a good sermon. It's not a people pleaser. But the result is 3,000 come to faith and they don't just come to faith, they repent. You know, my challenge, my fear with some of the youth we talked to, we brought some guys to faith. It's, it's all in small numbers, but, but with the guys we've met with, we tell them Jesus loves them, we introduce them to Jesus, we pray over them, and we say, look, this is what God thinks about you. And the danger is, if we're not careful, we add him into their lives rather than turn their lives upside down and say, actually, guys, sorry, he gives you life to the full, but it's a totally different life and it demands everything. At the moment, um, we're, we're preaching through, or I'm preaching through, uh, a series uh, in our midweek meeting on, on David and Saul. And, um, and, and I, I kind of trailed it as I'm going to preach on David. Guttingly, we're on about week 55. No, we're on week five. And, um, and we still haven't got to David yet. Because I'm more and more excited by Saul, by the lessons we can learn from Saul. And I think it really fits with this morning. I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, I'm not going to read you the whole of 1 Samuel. 
But, um, but if you remember, uh, before Saul, sorry, Samuel, yes, yeah, sorry, before Saul was called by Samuel, um, he was lo- he'd lost his donkeys. He was out looking for the donkeys. And he's like, he's so desperate, they can't find the donkeys, and they're like, what do we do? Where do we get the donkeys? And he goes, by now, my dad's going to be more worried about me than the donkeys. Oh, look at that. Wow. Um, <laughs> shouldn't be excited by modern technology, should I? Um, the, and they say that... Wow, now we've gone to Mark 10. Oh, you haven't got what I've got. Is that why you're laughing at me? I have, I have scripture verses coming up telling me stuff. So a minute ago I had 1 Samuel 10, exactly what I was going to talk about. Now I've got Mark 10, 46, saying a blind beggar needed healing. I don't know if that's a prophetic word from the guys on the screen. Um, is there going to be a queue in a minute? Shut up. <laughs> We're just closing down the live stream. Um, Saul was looking for donkeys and he's like, I don't know what to do. We can't find the donkeys. And his slave boy, his servant says, well, there's a guy here who's a prophet. And, and Saul it goes, okay, we'll go to him. We haven't got any money. We can't do it. He doesn't get anything of God. He doesn't have any idea. He doesn't even know who, who Samuel, this amazing prophetic figure, the kind of the leader of the people at the time is. And he gets to him. And he meets Samuel and he says, we're looking for the seer. And Samuel goes, it's me. So he goes, oh my goodness, hadn't noticed, hadn't realized. And then they have this most incredible conversation where Samuel says, you are going to be king. And he says some things that's going to happen. One thing is he says, because it's most important to Saul, you're going to find your donkeys. Stop worrying about that. Concentrate on the other stuff I'm now going to say. He also says, I know you haven't got any money left. You're hungry. You haven't got any food. As soon as you walk out of here, you're going to find out your donkeys are right and you're going to get lunch. For many people, that's probably the second most important thing. We're going to get out of here and we're going to find lunch. And then the third is he says this. After that, this is um, 1 Samuel 10, verse 5, for my friend on the screen. Um, After that, you'll go to Gibeah of God, where there's a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you'll meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high places with lyres, tambourines, flutes and harps being played before them. And they'll be prophesying. The spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you'll be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do for God is with you. And then skipping on a bit. As Saul turned, this verse 9, chapter 10, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying among the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Blokes that knew Saul knew he was into donkeys and food. No idea about God. And they see him and he is out there, the Spirit's on him, he's prophesying like mad. And they go, we don't get it. Different bloke. The reason I read you that is Saul encountered the Spirit of God. And this is Old Testament. Whole, you know, it's not on the level of our experience of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not coming to live in him in the way the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. And it says that God changed Saul's heart and he became a different person. And he would have been at the front of the church out in the Spirit. He had the experience. But we know the story doesn't go well from there. He had the encounter with God and God even changed his heart and made him a different person. But he didn't keep walking by the Spirit. And the thing we see really quickly is, well, first up, we have the kind of coronation bit, the bit where they're going to go, this is the moment your king is here. And a bit like, you know, some kind of reality TV show or contest, they have the thing of, okay, turn down the lights. We have the 12 tribes in front of us. It could be any one of the 12 tribes going through to the next round. It's one tribe. It could be Benjamin, it could be Judah. It's Benjamin. And everybody else in Israel steps back. And there you have that one tribe. And then they go, now, within that tribe, it is the the clan of Mitri. And everybody else steps back. And there's that one family group. And then it goes down to the family. It's Kish's family. 
And then, the moment you've all been waiting, the spotlight is focused on the one man who is going to be the king of Israel, Saul. Only he's not there. Slightly awkward. Cue ad break. (laughs) Find Saul. And they can't find Saul. And they have to ask God where he is. And God says, he's hiding with the donkeys. (laughs) Which is difficult, because Saul was a very tall man. So you'd have thought his legs would have been sticking out. Saul, who was called from the donkeys to be the king of Israel, goes back and hides with the donkeys. He's too scared. He's too worried. And his issues of his own insecurity about, about whether the people like him, about what the people want rather than what God wants, become too much Saul that within a couple of years he's written off as king of Israel. He's had the encounter of the Holy Spirit and yet it doesn't last. Is that true of us? We have the great experiences. We come and we encounter the Spirit. God does stuff even in our lives and he changes our hearts and he brings healing and yet we don't walk by him. We go back to the same fears. God sends us out into the world to proclaim Jesus but we get out into the world and we're actually a little bit more worried about what our friends think of us than what Jesus is asking us to do. Samuel's constant refrain to Saul is you've got to obey. It's not about what the people think, it's about obedience. Are we willing to be changed by God? Are we willing to let God deal with our mess? It's not that some of us are more messed up and broken than others and some of us are fine. David had his issues. David had a little bit of a thing for the ladies. David ends up breaking three commandments in quick succession, coveting adultery and murder. Saul didn't do that. But when David screws up, he comes back to God. He comes on his knees before God and he lets the spirit change and cleanse him. And interestingly, his biggest fear, Psalm 51, is the Holy Spirit will be taken from him. That God will stop being there with him. Interestingly, when Samuel challenges Saul and says, that's it, it's all over now, mate. If you look at it, all Saul's worried about is the fact that whether Samuel will go back with him before the leaders of the people and keep up appearances. And when Samuel says, I'm not coming, Saul grabs the coat of his, hem of his garment and holds on to him, dragging him out. Don't go, you've got to stay, you've got to. If you leave, I'll look an idiot. If you leave, people will stop respecting me. If you leave, I won't look so good. So much so that Samuel keeps walking and the garment rips. And Samuel turns around and says, that's it, the kingdom's ripped from you. What about us? We have the empowering presence of the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe, in us. Does that change us? Or is it just a comfort blanket? Is it just something that makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves or a great experience or we have a nice word of the Lord? Or does it change the whole package? Does it change everything of you? Are we allowing the Spirit to come in and convict us of righteousness and change us? Because it changes the world. And it starts with us. I am... I was at a conference the other day listening to talks and, and, and as I said, our church is quite small and actually it's quite hard work. We have the lovely people, we have, yeah, we have lovely people, I love them, but, but they're quite hard work. I used to work in a church in Birmingham, Mark and I knew each other in Birmingham. Mark remembers me from Birmingham, I don't remember him, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and, and a church, you know, church full of all ages and I just thought when I was coming to work for a youth church, I was like, oh, it'll be so good. No more old people. No more people that are slow to change and unwilling to deal with stuff and, you know, and, and don't like change. I'll be with youth and they're all up for change and unreliable and don't turn up and promise much and don't always follow through. I'd much prefer a church where everybody sits in the pews pretending they're engaging than doesn't turn up because they've got a better offer like sleep. And I went to this conference recently and they stood up and it was an Alpha conference. They were talking about the transformation Alpha has brought in people's lives. And they talked about it. One person stood up and they said, oh yeah, we, you know, we met with this guy and he was a rent boy and, um, and, and now he's a vicar. They didn't tell us the name of the person. They said they met, they met another woman who was a prostitute and is now a church leader's wife. And they talked about somebody else who was a, one of the most dangerous criminals in the whole country. And now he goes into prisons talking about Jesus. And I was like, this is great, Lord. Wow, praise you. Why is that not happening in my church? You know, Remboy vicar, prostitute, instantly is now a church leader's wife. Clearly, even higher level than your vicar. (laughs) 
And actually, they didn't tell the story of the journey. And I think sometimes we think the Holy Spirit will come in and bam, we're sorted. And God does work suddenly, but he's not the God of quick fixes. He's the God of journeying with us and changing us. The Bible is not a story of quick fixes. It's the whole lot, warts and all of people's lives. And are you willing to let the Spirit work in you day by day? Some of the times the Holy Spirit convicts us and challenges us or brings up pain, it's the last thing in the world we're willing to deal with. And we'd much rather just sing a song and pray in tongues and have the experience and avoid what God's actually saying. Are you willing to let the Spirit change you? To face up to the mess? Are you willing to journey with people who are in a mess, in the good and the bad, rather than just a quick prayer and walk away? Because that's what Pentecost is about. That's what we see as we read the epistles. It's not this glamorous, amazing church. It's a church like this one, but where they're saying, Holy Spirit, have your way. Not as a church, but in each one of us as individuals. Holy Spirit, have your way. And if there's anything in me, anything I need to deal with, I'm not going to cover it up. I'm not going to push it down. I'm going to do what you're saying. I'm going to end, but just very quickly, the verse we based our church on is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let's run the race with perseverance marked out for us. Let's be the people God's made us to be. Let's know who we are. We're not like the person next to us, so stop trying to be like that person. Don't wish you had this ministry they've got. Just be you, because you can't be anything else. Let's run the race with Let's build people up that by the Spirit, we're children of God and we can get on and do the stuff. And let's throw off everything that hinders and the word there literally is distracts. And let's throw off the sin that so easily entangles. And it's kind of like running a race. And as you suddenly discover you're carrying something you don't need to carry or you've got stuff wrapped around your legs, it's going rather than, oh no, I'm so useless, I'm so rubbish. Oh, Or just ignoring, going, Lord, praise you that I'm free. It's going, there's something there that's not right. Lord, what is it? Let's deal with it and let's get going again. And we're running the race, not for us but for God. And this church is not here for you. This church is here for those outside. We cannot. It is it's almost heresy to, to, to receive the Spirit, to receive God's empowering presence and keep it to ourselves. We just become a stagnant pool that people are bewildered by. I've said more than enough. Let's just pause. Let's just give a moment to the Spirit. Lord, I just pray that, that where I've said lots, Lord, that the words that are from you would go deep. And just to a sense, maybe just some of us, is, there may be something you're, you're reacting against what I said, in it, and that's completely fair. But maybe just if, if there's something in you that's stirred up, you're annoyed by something or you're upset by something, just ask God what that's about. What's pressing my buttons, Lord? I see there may be one or two people here that you're, you're, you find yourself close to tears. whether now or, or, or in church normally. And, and, and when the pain comes up, when the tears come, you just push it back down. And God's saying, it's okay. It's okay to let it come. There's pain there that you need to let him into rather than push away. But it's almost like when the Spirit's moving, it, it scares you, it, it, it upsets you, and, and that's because you just don't want to let him in, you're scared, and you don't need to be. And this is a bit of a tough call, and don't come under any condemnation. The Lord convicts so he can heal him free. But I think some of us, if we're honest, we've been quite selfish. We've, we've, 
We wanted more of God just for us. To make us feel more valuable, more, feel us feel make better about ourselves, a comforter. And we almost need to repent of the comfort blanket. Well, not almost, we do need to repent of the comfort blanket. Do you need to repent of, of, of even, for somebody I think church that has become about status. You wouldn't put it that black and white, but it's, it's, it gives you significance because of the role you perform or because of your standing. And you need to repent of that. Or you could become like Saul. Just come, Holy Spirit. And hey, maybe just, just, just a couple of weeks where you, you live under a massive lie that you're unlovable. You can't do any of the rest of the stuff because you just can't get beyond that. And maybe you're feeling even worse because of what I said. And, and it is first and foremost, you need to know you're loved. And God wants you to know that truth. And you may need to repent of that lie. It's not your fault you believe it. But you need to choose to repent of it and allow God to show you his truth. And I think finally, this is this, just some of you that, that God's saying, are you ready? Are you willing? You've been in the room. You've been filled with the Spirit. You have my Spirit. Are you ready to get out there? Are you ready to take me to the streets? And God's just uh, to asking for your response of your willingness to do that. And that may not be glamorous, that may not be big events, that may be just the conversations over a tea break at work. That may be the sitting down with the person in your street who's hurting. Are you ready? Are you ready to carry God into that place? I don't know what your normal practice is, but just if, if any of what I've said, if, if God's just doing stuff in you at the moment, do you want maybe just stand where you are? We'll just get Mark, just to get some guys to pray. Just if, you, if you're responding to, to any of that, or just God's, you just know the Spirit's at work. Just stand where you are. Just where people are standing, maybe people are just being sent to pray with them. This is, if you're standing, it's about you and God. The people praying are not doing the business. They're just there to support you. It's very random, just, just a, a, the words um, car crash in my mind. I don't know if that's somebody, you feel your life's a bit of a car crash or you've been in a car crash and you just, you're carrying stuff from that. Just if that's you, it'd be great for someone to pray with you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit.
just, um, just also just a sense that I began by sharing that word from John Glass about the river. Coming to the river for healing. And, and I, I just have a sense that, that God says that you can't lead others to the river. You can't minister to others in the river of healing if you're not willing to go there yourself. The church for too long, not this church, the church nationally, for too long we've let the spirit of truth, we've used the spirit of truth to tell others off, tell them what the truth is in their lives who are outside of the church. We need to let God's truth change us first. We need to repent of the stuff in our lives first. We need to let God into the depths of our being to bring healing. I just think still there's just some people here where you just, you're scared. For whatever reasons, you don't want to let God into that bit of your life. You can trust him, but you do need to let him in.